evening, everyone. I'm Rob with MMORPG.com. Tonight I have with me Ryan Dancy, CEO of Goblin Works, and they're currently working on Pathfinder Online. Evening, Ryan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. How are you doing this evening? Doing really well. I heard you guys got some crazy weather going on out there in the Pacific Northwest. I, I'd hate to say it's crazy compared to what's going on in the East Coast, but we had a little bit of snow, which was unusual. All right. Well, again, thanks for joining us. I just had some questions about your project, and um, based off of your recent blog posts, I've noticed you went ahead and you started explaining some of the dynamics of, you know, the money. Where exactly are you guys spending the money on Pathfinder Online? So, you know, that shows me that you guys are pretty transparent, and that's my first question is, uh, you know, what is transparency to you, and how important is it in this process? Well, we have uh, a unique circumstance because we raised so much money on Kickstarter, and we treat our Kickstarter backers as stakeholders in the venture of making Pathfinder Online. If they were shareholders, if they were investors, they would be entitled to a certain amount of financial disclosure. And so we think it's only fair that as stakeholders, we give them something close to the same level of, of information as we would give a shareholder. Um, we think that does a couple of things. It, it helps people understand that uh, the money that they gave us was, was spent reasonably and not you know, frittered away or you know, blown on you know, dumb things. Uh, and it also helps us to be accountable. So by knowing that we intend to be transparent and make those kind of disclosures to our backers, uh, it helps uh, you know, us make good decisions. Like we don't want to have to go to the backers and say, well, you know, we blew a bunch of money on this trip to Vegas. Um, not that we would do that anyway, but it's good to not have to have that conversation. So it's kind of a way of keeping ourselves honest. All right. Um, where are you guys currently at in the development of the game? I noticed the last blog post said you'd hit like your 4Q mile marker, but for those of us that aren't up to date with the developments in Pathfinder, what does that mean? So when we finished the Kickstarter, we, uh, we estimated that we had about 18 months of work to get to the point that we, uh, we call early enrollment, which is kind of like an internet beta, like a Gmail beta. The product will be ready to play, but it will be uh, a very minimal implementation of the eventual complete feature set. So we'll call that the minimum viable product. It's, uh, it's an MMO, it's a client server application. You'll be able to make a character and run around and fight monsters and harvest resources, convert the resources to crafted goods, um, engage in a little PvP. So kind of the most basic functions will be ready. So we believe that that would take about 18 months. So we divided our development plan into, um, into seven quarters. So uh, the first six quarters would, would take us from the day that we ended the Kickstarter until the day we were ready to begin early enrollment. And then the seventh quarter is basically the first three months of, of early enrollment. So uh, we are four quarters of the way through that process. We finished our, first, our, our fourth quarter milestone uh, the, the uh, second week of January. So the milestone we're working on now we call Q5. It's really the first quarter of 2014, but it's the fifth quarterly milestone. So we're, we're going to call it Q5 and confuse everybody. Okay. Uh, so this is really a, an important milestone. So the work that was done in the first four milestones got us to the point where we have pretty good visibility on what work needs to be done and the pace of the work that we're able to complete as we move closer to taking the game to early enrollment. We have, a, uh, we have a pretty good idea of what we think we absolutely need to have to start early enrollment. And then we have some things we'd like to have when we begin, but if we had to push them off and bring them in in the months following the start, it would be okay. And then there are some Wahoo goals that we'd love to have in if we could get there, but we don't know if we can get there yet or not. So uh, at the end of Q4, we have enough of the tool systems built. We have enough of the basic programming done. We have experimented with some of the interactions between the client and the server. And now we're able to start making some more informed decisions about what we'll do in the final two milestones before we get to early enrollment. So Q5 milestone, uh, which will be done in March, is going to take us into our alpha testing. So the alpha test will be even fewer features than the early enrollment uh, release, but it's going to co concentrate on 
uh, making sure that very fundamental parts of the game are working as intended. So the client and the server are able to interact with uh, you know, relatively few problems and the client renders basic graphics correctly on a wide variety of machines. Um, some of the game systems will be implemented and we'll start banging on them to make sure that they work as intended. And um, a lot of the art assets will get built and into the client so we can see how they look and make determinations about you know, what more we can add and, and how we want to affect the, the pace of art asset creation you know, as we move forward. The Q6 milestone, which will start as soon as we finish Q5, is going to be the milestone that takes us up to early enrollment. So when we finish Q5, we should, we should have a 90% confidence or so that um, the things we'll be working on in Q6 are the things that we will have in early enrollment. And, and at that point, we'll be able to start sharing that information with all the people that are in the community and helping to shape their expectations about what will be available for them when early enrollment begins. And then the, the Q7 milestone is essentially the first three months of early enrollment and that milestone is going to be uh, a lot of response to what happens in the alpha test and in the start of early enrollment. Like we, it's a huge project and we absolutely know that there's going to be all kinds of things that show up uh, as a part of just people playing the game. They're going to have to get immediately addressed and you know, that'll be kind of all rolled into that Q7 milestone. We'll, we'll make a decision about what gets into that milestone pretty much based on what happens in alpha and a little bit about what ha happens as we, as we finish Q6. The thing I would really like to point out is that this is a very non-traditional way of releasing an MMO. Uh, this is not a finished product by any stretch of the imagination. This is not the game that you would buy if we were selling this thing at 60 bucks uh, you know, in a retail store um, for people who, who were uh, expecting a finished and polished product. This is a unique opportunity for people who want to see how an MMO is built and who want to have a lot of input on the way features are implemented and the order that we implement features um, to participate with the development team. So we, we call that whole idea crowd forging. Um, so we did crowd funding and now we're going to do crowd forging. We're going to help enable our community to work with us to actually build this game out. The trade-off is that you start with the minimum viable product. You start with a game that has a very small number of features and a very limited amount of content. The upside is that you'll have an amazing opportunity to affect the way the game gets developed. So uh, it's not for everybody and we recognize that and our expectations about the number of players that we'll have are shaped by that belief. We're not going out and trying to get a million people to play Pathfinder Online the month that it releases. We're going to be very happy if we have you know a few thousand people playing it and if those few thousand people are happy with, with what they've got and the experience that they're having. Um, and that's all very non-traditional. So we have a lot of expectation shaping to do and a lot of management of expectations that we've got to work on. Speaking of managing expectations, uh, you know, Pathfinder being a pen and paper game isn't going to translate one-to-one -one into just a, a computer RPG, much less an MMORPG. You know, it, we look at like games like DDO where, you know, Dungeons & Dragons, you memorize spells. Well, that wouldn't really work in an MMO, so they... Did what everybody figured they would do and give it magic points and then you cast spells. What kind of changes have you had to make to kind of the core rule set maybe of Pathfinder to make the game possible as an MMO? So the first thing I would say is that uh, Pathfinder Online is a superset of the kinds of characters that you play in the tabletop game. So on the tabletop game, essentially all the characters are what I would call heroic adventuring characters. Uh, in the online game, in the MMO, you'll get to play heroic adventuring characters, but you'll also get to play a lot of other kinds of characters. Crafters and merchants and diplomats and soldiers and spies. A whole range of things that you would find in a world uh, that's populated by more than just, you know, clerics, fighters, uh, thieves and, and wizards. And expanding the scope of the game in that sense uh, requires us to create a whole lot of new content, new game mechanics, and new ways to interact with, uh, with the environment and between players that don't exist on the tabletop. Um, for example, the magic item crafting rules in the tabletop are very, very simplified. And most of what happens is done off screen. You don't really see very much of it. But in the online game, that's a huge part of what some people's whole play experience will be. So there needs to be a very detailed and mechanically rich 
design space for those people to interact with in terms of how things get turned from a lump of ore that they get out of the ground to a finished good that somebody actually does something useful with. For people that are interested in the heroic adventure mode, uh, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that uh, just doesn't translate from the tabletop to the online environment. The biggest difference is that the tabletop game uh, is not time bound. So there's no relationship between real time and game time. And the players can take as long as they need or as long as their friends will tolerate to figure out what it is they want to do. They can look up obscure rules in the text or have an argument with their game master or plot strategy or go have a slice of pizza or whatever. Um, but in the online game, it's a real world, it's a real time experience. So um, mechanics in the online game have to be designed around the idea that players make choices uh, that are mechanically interesting, but are uh, relatively uh, simple to make decisions about. They get all the information that they need in a relatively well-packaged you know, experience, and then they make a, a choice by clicking a button or activating a key of some kind um, in near real time. So, uh, you know, a, a, a combat in the tabletop game um, with six second combat rounds, you know, the real time amount of time that passes might be two or three minutes. Um, but that session might take four hours to play. In the online game, um, that session is going to take two minutes. Um, and that's a, that's a hugely different, you know, experience. So lots of rules have to be altered and lots of game systems have to be rethought to operate in that, in that you know, real-time world as opposed to the, the tabletop time world. The other big thing that's a change is that um, the, the tabletop game is based on the, uh, the materials in the system reference document from Wizards of the Coast that's licensed using the Open Gaming License. It's a derivative of Dungeons and & Dragons. And the Open Gaming License is not and was not designed to be a license for computer games. There are requirements in the Open Gaming License about uh, what licensing terms can be bound to content that uses that material, which is fundamentally incompatible with the way video games are made. Video games require a lot of licensing entanglements, both from the software that you use to create them and the terms and conditions that you have when you operate the service. So you can't just take the content from the Pathfinder tabletop game and seamlessly integrate it into an online experience. At least we can't. Wizards of the Coast could, but we, we can't. So we have to kind of parse the tabletop game and decide you know, what elements of the game are uh, are, are clearly uh, only available within the scope of the open gaming license and what components of the game are freely available as just elements of the public domain that anybody could use. Um, and, you know, luckily, a lot, lots of the elements of the game fall into that, into that classification. So um, we have the, the luxury of, uh, of having kind of a hybrid where a lot of the stuff in our game will be immediately familiar to anybody who's played on the tabletop. But we have the drawback in that some of the things, some of the terms and some of the game mechanics and some of the monsters and some of the spells and the magic items, we're not going to be able to use verbatim. And kind of our overall goal is uh, to make those differences as minimal as we can. So uh, a person who is familiar with playing a fighter on the tabletop, when they are exposed to the way the MMO plays, they should be relatively uh, immediately able to say, oh, I totally get it. You know, this is, uh, this is a mechanic that acts like this other thing from the tabletop that I already know. Or I understand intuitively how this gear works because it's similar to the way uh, magic items would function in the tabletop game. So we can't just take the tabletop rules and make a video game version of them. We have to make a new video game game that is Pathfinder Online in some fairly deep and meaningful way, but isn't just a copy. Uh, and that's definitely a struggle. That's, that's something that we work on all the time. And we have you know, raging debates about you know, what, what we can and can't use and uh, you know, what Paizo would like to see us use, our partner, Paizo Publishing, who's licensing the Pathfinder IP to us. Um, it, I won't say that it's, you know, it's endless, but it, it consumes a lot of time. <laughs> There's been a lot of discussion about it. Well, you um, know you know, looking at your site, it would seem like you guys have quite the pedigree of writers that, I mean, created a lot of original source material for D&D &D that are actually working on this project to create the Emerald Spire. Um, you know, yeah. one of them being Ed Greenwood, which pretty much single-handedly created the Forgotten Realms. So yep. it's, n it's not like you got a bunch of slouches trying to figure out, oh, man, how are we going to turn these source books into right. a video game? Right. 
know, yeah, they wrote we're, the source we're books. Really yeah, we're really fortunate. Like we've we've got lots.